A year ago, a very close friend of mine called me in panic. His 20-year-old daughter accidentally deleted her complete thumb drive containing all her pictures, videos of the last 10 years. That was a digital sledgehammer moment for her. Imagine all your digital life wiped in a second. Today, I want to talk to you about how sharing cyber crisis stories can save us all. We live in fascinating times. A lot of innovations take place. Cloud, artificial intelligence, virtual reality, quantum computing. But with these interesting opportunities come also a lot of risks. And unfortunately, just like there are in the real world, real criminals, in the digital world, we have cyber criminals. And they're out there for two things from you, your data and your money. And they operate in an invisible world. We only notice them when they become annoying, when they start to block our research, when they block payments through your smartwatch, when they start to you know, hit your supermarket and you can't pay because the store computers are blocked, or they lock your in-flight in entertainment system. Imagine that. They can also hack your car. And even worse, they found ways to hack the digital components on bicycles. Yes, indeed, they found ways to hack between the shifter and the derailleur and just changing gears without the cyclist knowing. We always believe that these cyber criminals operate in the dark with their nifty toolkit and they're really untouchable. Hitting us with a digital sledgehammer. Unfortunately, the digital tools and the cyber criminals are only part of the cyber crisis. Unfortunately, we do have a lot of issues in applications, bugs, vulnerabilities that happen. A famous example happened in July 2024, when a small update in a security tool called CrowdStrike created chaos worldwide causing the blue screen of death and $10 billion of damages. We always believe that our data is in pristine data centers where you can eat off the floor, right? Where everything is nightly labeled and everly tightly knit together. I've seen things you people wouldn't believe, but let me show you two examples of what is also a reality? This is where people have given up the discipline. When I invited the CEO of such organizations to come and watch for themselves, they were in shock, and they in a split second knew that their organization was unable to manage a data room. But if you think this is worse, well, there's a next level. Some people believe it's a good solution to put all the IT equipment in the laboratory room, saving space. MITRE is a non-profit organization that makes studies on techniques. Currently, they have identified 359 ways to attack systems. They've only identified 230 defense techniques. Let that sink in for a moment, what that does mean to you. I will also give you one statistic, a trend. This is the estimate global cybercrime costs, estimates from 2018 with even estimates to 2029. The trend is very clear. It looks as if the cyber criminals will have their run with a lot of more digital sledgehammer moments. 
What does actually happen when the cyber crisis hit you? Well, I was honored to have four of those digital sledgehammer moments in my career. And it's not fun. But what you do is you start with detecting and analyzing, logically. Because you want to know what's going on, what happened, who found it, can we do something, can we stop it? Analyzing it first. Then we start to respond. We try to find good solutions to kill the crisis. Can we reboot the system? Can we shut down the network? Will that solve the solution? Well, it takes a lot of work and a lot of iterations. Ultimately, the goal is to come to a solution where as if the cyber crisis never happened. But that's not all. You always have a lessons learned moment. Whenever the, the dust has settled and everything is done, we have to learn what worked well, what can we do better next time. That's very important because based on those actions, we'll make sure that there's a way to prepare for next time. Better protect our environment against the next digital sledgehammer. Making sure that we're better or faster in reply. The problem is with the lessons learned. Either it's not done because it's solved, let's not dwell on the past, it's over. Or it's done without any shred of action because those cost time and resources, right? And indeed, finding the root cause is important. The lessons learned, what happened? It's key to find out. Now, some cybersecurity experts will say, you are the weakest link. You clicked on that link. You made a mistake. I beg to differ. I am against that statement. I believe you are the strongest link. You are the human firewall, provided you get the right training, regular awareness, and the tools, and the means to connect if something digitally weird happens. That is key. Now, if something bad happens and your data is out there, it is like putting toothpaste back in a tube, meaning it's virtually impossible to put it back. Erase it. That is a fact. But I'm a cybersecurity leader for more than 20 years, and I thank this role because of my colleagues who mentored me, coached me, gave me advice, and shared their stories. And I think that's key. A cybersecurity leader handles this, 39 domains and 200 tasks, with a team, of course, and making sure that it's done on a daily, weekly, monthly, annual basis. If we simplify this, basically we focus on technology. We make sure that we protect technology with technology, but also with processes, making sure that it works. And of course, in an organization, making sure that the context, the vision, the strategy, the tools and the resources are made available. But most importantly, with people. You work in an organization, you work with these processes, and you work with technology. So you want to make sure that you actually are the glue to protect against the cyber crisis. In that 20 years, I've seen a shift in the role of a cybersecurity leader. Initially, it was a very technical role. It has evolved to a role that's encompassing about processes, about people, about strategy. It's almost like a butler. A cybersecurity person is invisible. We are doing a job, and if everything runs fine, nobody notices. And that's okay. We are ready, just like a real buzzer, to make sure that if something bad happens, we have a plan B, C, and D to make sure that our master, that you are okay, that you find your data and you can continue to work. 
Actually, I see a lot of analogy with the insurance business. Because just like in the insurance, we want to make sure that we protect you against the risks of a cyber crisis. It's important. And as always, if you do an insurance, if everything runs fine, you think, hmm, can I not do it with a little bit less insurance, a little bit less resources for the same security? But if things go really wrong, you're so happy to have a home, a car, or a travel insurance, don't you? Just like cybersecurity, when there's people who will be able to make sure the technology works, that the processes work, that everything is done. Personally, I can vouch for that because my wife, Peggy, is in the insurance business, same time as I'm in cybersecurity, and we relate, we have the same vibe in terms of protection and looking forward. We share all the vibes, but that would be for another TED Talk, with an other attribute. But the point is, sometimes I'm shocked at how people forget the past of cyber crisis moments. And it became clear to me when I found this concept, the fading effect bias. It's a psychological phenomenon where people tend to forget the negative, unpleasant memories and keep the pleasant, positive memories. The camaraderie, the long evenings with a lot of pizzas and hamburgers, the eureka moment when we found a solution to solve the cyber crisis. That is very normal. It's almost like a survival mechanism to make sure that what we do is actually okay. We want to forget neg negative things and only dwell on the positive things. But that leaves us with a huge gap because the fading effect bias in combination with the lack of lessons learned makes a great gap in the stories we can learn from others. It is almost like the quote from Blade Runner, where Rutger Hauer says, all those moments will be lost in time, like tears in rain. Isn't it a shame that of the 10,000 stories that are told globally, that's, that's just the tip of the tip of the iceberg? What if we could gather all those stories and really learn to avoid the next crisis? Wouldn't that be great? Now, why are we not sharing this? Well, the reason is obvious. Executives hate failure. They hate their reputation tarnished, legal consequences, bad products, impact from customers. They hate that. So they want to avoid that and keep it quiet, even inside their organization. The next are legal and regulatory reasons. The fact that they want to avoid legal repercussions or investigators not allowing to share stories is annoying. So what is the solution? Well, I firmly believe that cybersecurity leaders should be allowed to share their stories on the platform. A platform that is neutral, where people are vetted, making sure that they work in a secure way in real time without any commercial interest or vendor, because those, those are a conflict of interest, obviously. And the Chatham House rule is very important, because we want to make sure that whatever we learn, we're not going to point out who stated it and who's doing it. Do we do that in reality? Absolutely. I do that, and I share my stories with my peers in the real world, but especially in the digital world. We have a signal group where 585 European cybersecurity leaders already start sharing cyber crisis stories. And we learn from it, and I can tell you, it is marvelous. It has helped evading a lot of these sledgehammer moments. So, what are the three reasons why we should start sharing these stories? Well, the first reason is, of course, that we want to improve our response. The faster I can share this with my colleagues, the faster they can stop or even prohibit or delete the cyber crisis attack. 
The second reason is, of course, awareness and intelligence. We learn how to raise the defenses and make sure we don't fall for the same error. And finally, we want to strengthen solidarity, collaboration and trust, especially emotional support. It is very lonely when a cyber crisis hit you as a leader. Working together with others, getting that emotional support and other tips is extremely valuable. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is why sharing cyber crisis stories can save us all from the next digital sledgehammer moment. Thank you.